Aloha, 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 everybody. Aloha. My name is Anthony. Uh, I am the new president of the East Hawaii chapter of the Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers. I also work with Hoola Farms. We run the Hilo Food Hub and the Hawaii Farm to Car Market. And I'm really happy today to be here with the Farm Bureau and with Ken from Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers for this presentation. I'm gonna kick it off with just a little intro to Ho'ola. You guys aren't familiar. Also, hello to everyone on Zoom. There's uh, like 70 people from the Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Group. So hello everyone. If you are not familiar with Ho'ola Farms, please check out our website, ho'olafarms.org. You can find all our other programs. We are running some master food preserver courses this year along with uh, financials for farmers. That's happening uh, starting tomorrow, actually. Uh, we work with Bird and Bee in Honoka'a to do intro beekeeping courses. Um, and we also do agribusiness development, value-added products, and we're doing an orchards class uh, in November. So these are all four-week classes. The Hilo Food Hub is, is in Keokaha. It's 555 Kalani on Ole, right near the port. <laughs> And the Hilo Food Hub is a commercial kitchen space for rent. So people that need to make value-added products, they need to do so in a commercial kitchen facility, which if you've ever tried to make one, it takes a while. So you can rent ours and get your green pass from the county and start selling your products. Did you bring your jelly that you made in the last class for everybody? I did not bring my jelly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then we also run the farm to car market, which was started by... Hewa County Farm Bureau back in COVID, we took it over and it is a really great place to buy local produce and to sell local produce. So whether you want to sign up as a producer or a shopper, it's hawaiifarmtocar.org. And there's also little cards out there with QR codes that you can scan and go right to it. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Megan to talk a little bit more about the Farm Bureau. Aloha, Kako. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you all for being so punctual. I think this is the earliest we've ever started a workshop. So thank you all for being here. My name is Megan Blazak. I'm the current president of the Hilo chapter of Hawaii Farm Bureau. Thank you, Ken, for being here. It's our honor. I won't take up too much of your time so we can get to the main event here. I wanted to um, take this opportunity to introduce Hawaii Farm Bureau to you, if you're not familiar, we have a couple board members here tonight. So as I mentioned, I'm the current president. We also have our secretary, Justine Melamela in the back. And then Eileen Ye, our treasurer is also back there. So feel free to talk to any of us if you have questions about Farm Bureau. Hawaii Farm Bureau, founded in 1950, we're coming up on 75 years of being the voice for Hawaii's agriculture. Our mission is to protect, advocate, and advance the social, economic, and educational interests of our diverse agricultural community. So we help ranchers, we help crop growers, we help beekeepers, aquaculture, we're still working it out, but um, pretty much, you know, we're agnostic as far as what kind of agriculture you engage in, what you're growing, how big you are, where you're from. Our membership consists of 2,000 families across the state. We have 11 chapters. Oahu is pretty robust. This island has five chapters, so if you're interested in joining and you're not from the Hilo area, there are other chapters around the island. And I... I wanted to share a little bit about what we do. The Farm Bureau kind of shows up in a lot of different ways in the community and in the news. And so I think our, our biggest strength and what we're known for is our legislative advocacy and leadership in the political space. You know, year after year, we're at the ledge. Uh, we're lobbying on behalf of farmers. Uh, our entire platform are issues that we take to the legislature, they're all crowdsourced from our grassroots membership. You know, big agricultural corporations are not dictating what we do. It comes from family farmers. Uh, this session, some of the, uh, the headline issues we're working on, state agricultural lease extensions for multi-generation farms in Paniema. Act 90, if you've been around, you probably know about Act 90. This is a decade long kind of political administrative battle to transfer agricultural lands from DLNR to HDOA. 
there are active agricultural enterprises on DLNR lands that probably deserve leases under HDOA. Um, it would be better managed under the HDOA. Uh, foreign small equipment agriculture pilots. So we know in Hawaii we're kind of small, but we're mighty. And oftentimes there's foreign equipment from Japan, Italy, that would be really great for our specialty crop farmers, but we can't import it for different regulation reasons. So we're trying to open the doors for more opportunity to do that kind of stuff and increasing meat processing and inspection capacity. So lots of issues, land, water, infrastructure, uh, economic performance of farms, you name it. If it's important to you, Farm Bureau will listen and take it to the ledge. Um, we also publish Hawaii Farm and Food Magazine quarterly. There's some copies on the table. Um, it's really a fantastic magazine. Uh, Farm Bureau also runs several farmers markets around the state. So on Oahu, there's many that Farm Bureau operates on this island. Our only Farm Bureau market is in Kona at Keaho. Uh, so that's a big piece of what we do. We run the state farm fair every July. It's, yeah, the state farm fair, it's on Oahu, but if you wanna go and you're a member, you know, Hilo County, you know, we'll, we'll make a plan and we'll get ourselves a booth over there every July. And then farmer outreach and education, what we're doing here tonight, if it's important to you, we want to provide the resources to help you achieve your goals as a farmer. And so with that said, by a show of hands, how many of you have patroned one of these businesses ever? <laughs> All right. All right. So member benefits, um, there is a fee. You can, you can um, transition thing. The, so there is a fee to be a member of Farm Bureau. It's annual. A regular men membership is $95. This gives you voting rights and it gives you the privilege of serving on the board of directors um, if you're so elected by your peers. If you're not ready to jump into regular membership, we do have a Friends of the Farmer membership, which is a little less expensive, $65. You still get all the same benefits, um, but you just can't vote and you can't be on the board. And so if you want to dip your toe in, you can start small and then go big if you like it. And I just, you know, I just graduated with my master's in business. So the next slide is my sales pitch on how the membership pays for itself. And these are at my, my actual experience uh, in my personal shopping. So at Office Depot, if you're printing stuff, it's very expensive, right? Nice glossy posters, trifold brochures, banners. You can get up to 50% off on that printing with our membership. So on one $200 expense at, at Office Depot, you've already paid for your membership. Hawaiian Airlines, I'm from New Jersey, right? It's pretty far away. Tickets are expensive. Um, if you buy two $1,000 flights to the mainland at a 5% discount, you save $100. Membership paid for it. <laughs> Verizon, I have Verizon for better or for worse. You can get an 8% discount on your monthly bill over you know, over the course of a year, if you have several lines, you could be saving almost $200 membership more than pays for itself, right? So consider joining. Um, it's pretty low investment if you want to be super active, if you just want to show up to workshops, we invite you. There are lots of ways to sign up. Talk to one of the board members here tonight, and then please save the date. Our annual meeting is Wednesday, April 12th. We have flyers in the back. It's open to the public. You don't have to be a member. Um, we're going to be talking about agricultural theft. So it should be a pretty rowdy uh, <laughs> keynote, but hopefully productive and relevant uh, to your needs. So yeah, I've been in Hawaii for 10 years, so not too long, but I've been following the work of Ken Love all this time. And this is my first Ken Love presentation. So I might be the most excited person here. <laughs> and without further ado, Ken Love, everybody. Oh, thanks. I got to take my hat off. That's something you never see is me without my hat. So, um, actually, I should really give this to this guy sitting over here, Jim Mole, who was one of the founders of HTFG back in 1989. So, thank you for laying the. Uh, It's great to see so many old friends like Alan and Tom and everybody I forget, sorry. Um, oh, where to begin? I don't know. So anyway, I should say something about HTFG. We have 1,800 members and the cost of joining HTFG is only $50. So, and uh, we, we have some things like the 
the best DHX shipping rates in, in, in the country. And we, the reason we have the best DHX, we have a couple members who join only for the DHX rates. And so remember that when you ship your meat out. Uh, the, uh, I have all these incriminating photos of the owner. So we got great rates. <laughs> well, but I mean, he was, you know, it was my third birthday party and he was two. So uh, that's how long we've known each other. Brad, if you're on Zoom, sorry. Uh, Anthony had mentioned Hawaii Master Food Preservers, and I'm also the director of that. We finished the June, uh, January classes. June are the next classes, but it's already filled, so he's already booked in 2024. Paul is a graduate. Anthony barely, no, he graduated. <laughs> I got to pick on somebody. Actually, it was Danny Thomas taught me how to talk to big crowds, and, and I wound up, he, when we got married, this is my wife, Margie, who's been putting up with me for 47 years. And when <laughs> Danny at the Sands Hotel and Danny Thomas is the show. And he, who got married today? So our hands shot up. And the whole two hours, they put the spotlight on us. And revolved, the whole show revolved around crazy things that happen in a marriage. Yeah, I can understand it after 47 years, right? So um, he, um, years later, I was sitting next to him on an airplane. And I asked, how do you get up in front of all of these people and talk and not get nervous? There's 3,000 people in there. And he says, it's easy. I just find somebody and pick on them. So Paul, Anthony, Scott, on Zoom, you guys are in. So it's that simple. We'll try not to pick on you too much, Paul. Okay, so a lot of you seen some of the posters. Anthony was kind enough to bring all the fruit posters back there. Um, we're having a lot of issues with avocados now, so I thought I'd start with that because there's a lot of people um, trying to decide what to do because all of a sudden there's no leaves on the tree, there's no photosynthesis, the fruit are small, and <coughs> get sunburned or fall off or something, and Basically, sorry if I block you guys, just yell at me to move or something. Since the camera's followed, me, but I can't see the thing. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I've never seen it before. Uh, anyway, so all I can say is if you don't want to spray stuff every two weeks, plant citrus. <laughs> uh, it, it's a problem. We, uh, the, the feds have been over every couple of weeks to take tissue samples of about 20 cultivars from my farm, another 10 or 20 from UH and kind of Liu, uh, plus some from the Waiakea station here, the federal station, where there's, uh, there's a, lot, a, a lot of other different ones that we don't have in Kona. Um, what I'm finding out is that the most resistant one to plant now is Nishikawa. And Nish Nishikawa is a, you know, old Hawaii. It's impossible for you guys to see it, but. How do you spell it, Ken? Nishi, N-I-S-H-I, Kawa, K-A-W-A. It means West River in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the most resistant. So it takes about 14 months before the leaves fall off, whereas Charwell takes four months or five months and the leaves are gone. So it, it varies a lot. Um, the, the one that follows that in terms of its resistance is daily 11 or Otaro, which could be up to 14 inches. It's one of those monster avocados. And it was the uh, first one brought here in 1947 from Mr. Igami, who worked at for you, H and finally you. So, yeah. Uh, I have been a new, newer person, newer grower here, and I've had an avocado tree that I've had to just yank out because time and time again, it, the leaves are just getting what I would call a, a rust. It, 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 it's fungus. called lace bug. It's not a rust or fungus. It's right. avocado so, lace bug. Is this the problem that you're talking about? Yes. So in I've, every, I've got it. Everybody's got yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Everybody in the state. Oh, I don't have it. Well, you do. If you don't yeah. now, you will in two weeks. And so, how recent is it? Uh, four or five years, maybe. 
Yeah, it was 2018, 2019. Yeah. yeah. It and came I'm, with COVID. <laughs> so are the tree, and, and what I saw was it, it, it affected it once and it lost all the leaves and some leaves grew back and it looked really good and then boom. So in, in other, yeah, exactly. And it'll happen over and over right. and over. And that's lace bug. Now there's another bug called lace wing, not related, that eats lace bugs. Lace wings will defoliate white spote and then that comes back. But that continues to fruit, and there's no problems with the fruit. You can spray the Tanagard, and that'll that'll help with the lace bugs. But you got to spray both sides of the leaves, and you know a lot of trees around here. You need binoculars to see if there's still fruit on top. Now me, my avocados. I'm the only one you'll hear bitch about having to bend over to harvest <laughs> avocados because I prune them in the Japanese system where. The trees are about this tall, and I and I overdid it. I wanted to pick the fruit here, not the top of the tree, so I'm trying to bring it up because we have like on Malama, which is a great <coughs> avocado, and it's um, I you know that's uh, probably third in the level of resistance. So, and that's one that the USD is the VA is going to approve for shipment, like Sharwa. So, Malama is a good one if you still want to have avocados. We stopped grafting avocados because and we go through thousands and thousands of plants every month um, that we sell to support white tropical fruit growers, which Anthony will start doing someday. tonight. Tonight. Plants oh. for sale. Oh, okay. He's got trees for sale. <laughs> um, the, um, and our grafted, like our grafted citrus are only $25. And we make sure that it's the actual thing, not like the ones you buy from big box stores where it's really the rootstock that's grown off and the craft had died. And, uh, you wonder why lemons or, or your, your uh, kumquats are like this big and yellow. Anyway, so we, we started growing avocados in the greenhouse now because new leaves come out after the graft, the lace bug gets them, and there's not enough energy left in the scion for the next pair of leaves. So um, it's a pain. And we haven't had any good avocados to eat this year. These are where other uh, new cultivars of avocados that we were working with. Like Bayshore um, is a Sharwell seedling, that thing, will hang on the tree forever in a normal year. So it's one that you have to pick too. And it's, I think it's better than Charwell. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do too with uh, Tracy Matsumoto at USDA at PBARC is to determine the origins of specific strains of avocado. We got a grant we just put in to do DNA analysis of the different cultivars so we can know which ones are related to each other. For, in terms of figuring out which what, what the resistant traits are for for lace bugs. But Hulumanu is this long green thing and it's got a teardrop shaped seed that you know you can use two of them for maracas. <laughs> um, but it's pretty good. Uh, Mr. T after one of my teachers, Mr. Takashi was the one I did. This is George Shatower who was Jimmy Stewart's ranch manager in Bono Molino in the old days. And he developed these two. So there's, you know, we have about 300 types of avocados on the island, 300 different cultivars. The USDA in Riverside has 1,411, 1,611 registered in their database. And there's about six of ours. So there's a lot of avocados out there. So this is, this is a, a, another new one. Um, it was with a Chinese TV crew and we were going through, this is before, uh, before COVID, 2019, I guess. Um, anyway, we're filming at the, at the university station um, and, and going, walking up to where all the new avocado planting is in, in Kainaliu. And, um, we walked by a tree that I never look at anymore because after 15 years, there was nothing on it. You know, a seedling tree. And it's the cameraman from the Chinese film crew looking up. Because <gasps> there's a 
big black avocados hanging from the tree. It was the first time that tree had produced, so I named it after him. His name is My Mai. <laughs> <laughs> and she she was the producer. He was filming something out in the water. Anyway, we did a taste test for the chefs at um, American Culinary Federation Kona Pahala Chefs Association. And so we had a lot of uh, out of 10 avocados that we tried that are different from previous taste tests we did. This, I think Mai Mai was number three, uh, Kahalu was number two, and the, the, the one they liked the best was called CCLOV. And CCLOV means Captain Cook left of the Vargas. It's just a place <laughs> name. And I don't know what to call it. I wanted to know where it is. So it's at the Captain Cook experiment station left of the Vargas tree, which I knew because that was at the end of the road. <laughs> and it produced, I never really paid it much attention because it was a lime green, bumpy like Charwell, but it turns out the oil content <coughs> was more than Charwell. Uh, Daily 11 was the one talked about. This was uh, the second most late plug resistant one we found. <clears throat> where uh, the leaves last about 11 months before it defoliates. So, but this is where it may go. This is the ag theft one. They broke into my farm and jumped the 6,000 volt electric fence and stole all of them off the tree last year. So, uh, but they, they lasted a long time. How feel? Oh, that's okay. You can surpa is another one. This okay, go back. <laughs> surpa is one that we found at UH station that nobody knows the origin really. But Jim Babian, who used to be the executive chef at the Four Seasons, um, and now owns Pueo Osteria and Waimea. This was his favorite avocado out of maybe a hundred of them I had to force feed him. You think I picked on you, you should see me with chefs. Chefs are, I talk about a lot because arguably they're our best customers. Ken. Yep. Um, you've given us these names of these uh, lace bug resistant varieties. Um, where are they available? How can we get them? Um, <laughs> that's always the problem. Yeah. So um, I would plant nice big fat avocado seeds if you can find them now. And then when it gets about that big, you graft onto it, two, two or three scion on, this, on the same trunk. And that'll help keep the tree lower because the energy is being divided into both of them. And, um, you just have to, you either have to take one of the grafting classes, we'll have to come over and do that. Um, so these are you, not available commercially or no? Well, they are from, Usually we have them, but since I'm not grafting them now, once the, the, we have some like this in the greenhouse and when they get like this, then I'll cut them and graft them. And the scion, the, the top part of the graft, um, doesn't have lace, lace bugs, only the leaves do, according to USDA. So who besides Alan works for the feds? Oh, in her? Oh, no, I left that. Oh, I know, I know, sorry. <laughs> Lucky. Uh, but I've been married 47 years too. Eh? You got Same more way. hair than me too. Uh, okay. Um, a lot of times this is called local lemons. You see these trees out in fields and there's just like tons of these uh, healthy lemons. Some it's related to Volkemeyer, which is a well-known citrus rootstock that's pretty popular. And using this as a, it's a great lemon. It's extremely juicy if you can find the tree and those we have. It's um, a lot of juice and it's a good producer year after year. And uh, it has about eight times the root mass of other rootstocks. So if you're gonna graft um, a sour fruit, or like grapefruit or something, this would be the best root stock. Sweet fruit, some of it, it's not a great difference, but some of it transmutates from the root stock to the scion. So if you're using a sour fruit as your root stock for 
a super sweet tangerine, you're going to lose one or two percent bricks. So if you want it super, super sweet, then you would use a trifoliate rootstock like Carrizo, which is the one we, we use. Um, other, uh, other new types of citlet, cit, cit, citrus. Thanks. Um, I get nervous because I know Scott's <laughs> on Zoom. You know? uh, the, uh, all of these things, if people think there's no one type of satsuma, it's like if you ask the average chef that comes to the island, how many types of uh, avocados do you think we got? <laughs> Florida and California, right? <laughs> and they don't realize that there's thousands of types of avocado. It's the same thing. How many types of satsumas? There's 43 types of satsumas. Satsumas is just a part of Kyushu Island in Japan, just another prefecture. And so um, a lot of things come from it. So these are three fairly new types in Hawaii that were we're working with as well as pixie you know like the cuties you get in the bag in the store and the uh okinawan tangerine some of the other navels i mean it keeps changing uh, we have two types of yuzu now uh, yuzu is the japanese citrus that's really popular for making lots and lots of uh, products and it's it's really great so you got yuzu which is kind of a lemon lime hybrid thing so right you, you, yeah, it's extremely popular. But what, what, what they do with value-added products in, in, in Japan and Korea is they'll have, they'll take the yuzu and they'll make jelly. And they'll make the jelly or jam or marmalade three times. And they just put three different labels. This, is, this one is to mix with your tea for yuzu tea, which you can buy at Kilauea Market. And... Um, this one is to put with your yogurt, and this one is to use as a jelly. Same product with, with three different labels and three different marketing campaigns. Often the same company doing it. So, but they're selling two times as much until people realize I can use this for everything. Um, the only thing I ever wanted to name for me was my pomelo or zabong or jabong or shaddock or whatever you want to call it. It's got like Ten names, um, and it's a real. It's not real big like these monster pink Chandlers or Kalaharas, but it's a smaller one, like a big grapefruit. Only it's green on the inside. It's super sweet and very juicy. It never gets dried out like a lot of the other pomelos. And all the citrus we we do have it. Our HTA. Another thing about HTFG is that we have two acres on each island where we grow out lots of these different plants so people could get propagated material if you're a member. And so it's one of the benefits of membership that, that we have. All right, so one of the oranges that we're trying to get the companies in California now to propagate is the Paris orange. This is on uh, George and Margaret. George was my mentor here. And uh, Margaret is 95 or 90, 95. 96 in May. Right? Yeah. Yes. And my wife still cooks for Margaret every day. Are you going to have to run home now? I well, we got a complaint. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, this produces, this tree was planted by Archibald Menzies in 1792. Menzies sailed with Captain Vancouver as in Vancouver, Vancouver, to pick up Captain Cook's bones. And Men Menzies, among being a, a, a pretty well-known botanist in the UK, he was also the first non-Hawaiian to climb Mauna Kea and to track all of uh, the native plants that he could, could list. And so some of his writings are really fascinating in that regard. But he planted this, and it's on... Um, Margaret's great, 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 great something or other grandfather. And he built all the old stone churches in Kona and built the house that where this is. Um, we had the, the wall built around it to protect the root system a couple of years ago. But we're still harvesting from this. Sweet, wonderful. Every year. It's the best Valencia type orange you can imagine. 
So some of the history of the plants and when they came to Hawaii is really fascinating too, and see how some have been adapted locally and some, some haven't. By Abe Apuri. So a lot of us in, in Kona, we can't grow, anybody growing Mexican or key limes? Are, are they growing for you, producing? Yeah. They, not, they, not, not great, but. Uh, so they, they, for us, it, they, they die off, you know, before they can produce. I mean, they just can't take the heat. They can't take the, 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 the rock bees, you know, it's, people come to plant something in my place with a shovel and I just laugh. <laughs> you know. uh, but Abia Puri is botanically, it's the same name, the uh, same botanic name as the Mexican or key lime, but produces all of these great limes like this. And it's the same type of thing. You just, I mean, I have celiac, so I can't drink beer, but when I cut this lemon, I just keep thinking Corona. <laughs> You'd like it. So a lot of things are 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 Whoa, different now. Yeah, some big Buddha's hands. So pe people ask, what do you do with these at Bushukan in Japanese? Because it goes on the home altar or butsudan um, because the smell is so good. I used to leave them in my truck until they rotted two months later after I forgot about them in the back seat. But they're uh, really good. We used to sell them to Kenichi's restaurant in Keho Shopping Center because they use the zest a lot. So there's a lot of things you can do. A lot of the old timers in Hawaii would take the fingers, cut them up in little pieces, and, and uh, coat them in powdered sugar and freeze it for candy. So if you grew up in the pre World War II area, that's, that was your candy. Uh, heavy su is another one of the strange Japanese citruses that we're growing out. It's kind of like a um, an orange lemon, as opposed to Rangpur lime, which is the orange lime. Um, Chikwasa is another great Japanese citrus. You can buy canned drinks with this in, in train stations in Japan now. And it's... it's um, it's kind of orange colored, but it's more lemon lime and flavor. It's like the seven up without all the carbonation. So it's a great flavor. And it grows mostly in Okinawa and Kyushu in Southern Japan. So Anthony, you did bring one of these, right? I did, yeah. I, I was at Food Man and I was like, I wonder how much this sumo is. <laughs> and I and I and I he asked me how much you think this was, and I said three bucks for one. It was, and it was $3 and two cents. And two cents so I'm pretty close. Um, hey, will it follow the sumo? Actually, the sumo tournament's going to start in a few days, so I'm, I'm getting in shape again. Um, sumo is actually, uh, uh, the, the origin of sumo is dekopan in Japan, which is just super sweet. I mean, I hear Mineola tangelo is the sweetest fruit that we really go grow. And um, these in Japan, the Dekopan are sweeter than our Mineolas. The ones in from Whole Foods, not so much. <laughs> but that it's a sport of Dekopan called Shiranui. And so we're growing Nanko. Yeah, so we hope. It should be another year before we can release them, but hopefully at that time we'll have, you know, a hundred of them to sell. The problem is if we all grow one or two of these, you know, it doesn't really make a market. So come at your age, you've got to grow a hundred acres of them. Get Anthony to help you finance the land. Tom's a real estate attorney. He make sure all the paperwork's fine. You just got to get to know everybody. But that's how we're going to make a market for Hawaiian citrus. And he's going to buy it all to make me back there. See, with the black hat on. How's the CTV virus doing? The which one? The Tristasia virus. Oh, Tristasia or or HLB? HLB we don't have citrus greening or long long something. And if we have, if we get that, I'm going to 
give up and move to a condo on a leaky drive. But <laughs> <laughs> the the um, Tristasia on this side is a lot worse. It's almost unheard of in Kona. We don't have the rain. Of course, 2019 was normal for us. We had 32 inches of rain. You get that a week here, right? <laughs> right. In 2020, you thought we were living in Hilo. In fact, I mean, I was ready to move to Guam. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was uh, we had 111 inches in the, the following year. So from 32 to 111, except all of a sudden we got great citrus. We had a ton of breadfruit that year. I mean, you know, things that, that like the rain. So, but uh, didn't matter for avocados because the lace bug had already found us. And um, that is what it is. That's going to be the name of our next company. It <laughs> is what it is. <laughs> so this is another one. Now, right, right now, this is, um, it's a mangosteen family. They're, they're only about this big. It's a sweet tart. I like it much better than mangosteen. Uh, the only producing tree outside of India is at my farm. Although we've given a lot, to, Oscar's got them going now and some of the other uh, growers on both sides. And so we've been giving them out because this has really good potential for, uh, for us because it's much more forgiving. It grows much faster than mangosteen. The fruit, uh, you know, bigger than a quarter. Pretty close. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's going to be longer than a grafted tree, and we don't have. I, I see. Actually, I brought five hundred seeds back from India, and I got about six of them because the wild pigs tore through that one nursery before I put oh. on a six thousand pound fence and then just wrecked. You know, four hundred and fifty of them. It's been about seven years from seed to fruit. This year, there's lots of it on there again. But yeah, about seven years where mangosteen can be, uh, you know, up to 20 years, depending on your microclimate. But that's in Kona on irrigation. So I, I irrigate rain or shine every day. Um, and it's very little water sometimes, but it's every day at the same time. And the trees really like the regularity of it. It seems that their roots will, hey, it's time to eat, right? And so the roots tend to expand microscopically anyway and, and be able to soak up more water and nutrition. So I do everything UH says not to do. You know? <laughs> um, it, or water at the tree line. Well, what we did was test some. So here's my, my tree. And my watering is a shrub bubbler right next to it for the first three years. And I'm getting a lot more water going on it like that. And the water is, and all of a sudden, you know, after three years, my trees are like this. It, it's, um, the roots may be only this big and a big root ball. Then you move the water out. So it's a spraying, you know, from three feet and you have eight to 15 times the amount of roots going out now through the water than you would have if you started at, with the water going at the tree line. So for young trees, it it's, uh, really works well or just to increase root mass on trees that are having problems. Now that's for us in Kona where, you know, we got three inches of rain and the next morning it's it's bone dry because it just just sucked right down through the through the rocks because we you know it's just uh, the way it is I don't know if we have koa uh, since Scott's watching Scott started our, our repository on Kauai at the National Tropic Botanic Garden and he's, he's one of the managers there. And it's got did an amazing job getting it going. So a lot of these things that we have on Kauai now uh, would be available to uh, members. Uh, mangosteen, so everybody raves about this, you know, besides durian, they call it the uh, queen of fruits, where durian's the king of fruits. 
And in India, they call jackfruit the king maker. But, um, for me, it's just too sweet. It's kind of insipid. So I, I want koa or I want madrono, which is this one, another gar garcinia madrono. So kupuasu is, a, is another one that's getting popular and it's theobroma, so same family as cacao. We have a new one now, theobroma. We haven't even found the species name. It's from Ecuador with small leaves. It has smaller, very sweet chocolate pods and it makes a very sweet chocolate and unique to Ecuador. So we, we have a lot of things from different countries that don't really exist outside of those uh, native locations. This is Trina is the manager of Fruit Forest Farm in Queensland. We, we have, there's some on the Hilo side already, some at UH, but not a lot of them. Uh, they grow them in Queensland and ship truckloads to Sydney and they're sold all over the place. In Brazil, they make chocolate from this. They make chocolate from Theobroma bicolor, which kind of the pod, big pod looks like a brain. A beautiful, beautiful pod. Yeah, Jim. Are there ones on this side grafted or trees? Of uh, the kupuasu? Yeah. I've just seen the trees. Yeah. They don't, uh, the UH, they're not listed as a particular cultivar. Uh, just kupuasu, Theobroma. So I, I tend to doubt it. Um, probably Brazil would be the only place that would keep track of the cultivars for, for these, where it's, it's most popular for origin. Yeah. Uh, Hedelai, where was your experience? Somebody tried to- Yeah, Hilo Farmer's Market. Oh, they tried to sell them uh, meringue as, oh, it's meringue, Hedelai, same thing. It was, marked, a, it was marked Petalai. I was like, this looks, is this, is this like meringue? He's like, yeah, it's meringue. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take it because I want a meringue. <laughs> well, uh, meringue is a, a autocarpus odoratissimus and it's a smooth fruit, like a, like a big breadfruit, almost the same size, only kind of that color. Um, this is petali, and it's got the hairs on it, and it's the same size. It's pretty big. This is the outside. This has got to be one of the best tasting fruits ever, and there are a fair number of them on this side of the island. Whether Oscar is selling trees or fruit or seeds, I don't know. Yes. But yeah. I had meringue and it took a bath because I wasn't going to give that much space. Um, I, I've got it where I've kind of forced lower branches for the meringue. Oh, it still grows way the hell up there. I mean, but I've got branches that I can reach out and grab, grab them, you know, or catch them off. There's other ones that I'll, I'll need a 15 foot picker to get, but the next 15 feet, I forget it. So, but they're, I mean, they're worth it. So there's a reason it's called meringue. I, I have no idea why they call this petal eye, but it's, uh, it's a horrid name for fruit, right? But it, it, it's delicious. Looks like the Lombaton fruit, but of course they're only this big. Yeah, yeah, it's much bigger and it's much sweeter. And, and there's little tiny white seeds inside each one of them. So it's mean? related to jackfruit, right? So you've got a core that grows down the middle and all these carpels are coming off the core. They squeeze out the seed and just, I, yeah, we sat and ate all of these in a half hour. Here's another artocarpus. Um, my look is, um, this is real, this one wasn't quite ripe yet, but it's, so you can still see the latex in the fruit. It's uh, unique to artocarpus and Mertaceae. So it's, you know, distant cousin of fig as well as breadfruit and jackfruit. But this is really good, sweet pink flesh when it's soft and it has, I uh, can't really see them, but little white seeds off the core, but you just eat the, the pink part. And mine are finally flowering again. So thanks to all your rain that you sent us. I gave up on these in Kona and tried a number of trees. In fact, I can't think of a producing tree in Kona. I didn't have any luck with them over at HBT either. Yeah. Huh? 
Well, if Deb can't grow it, then forget it then. <laughs> you can switch. Huh? It tastes really good though. Oh yeah, they're way better than rambutan. Yeah. I think. And they're like you know, hard squeeze toys, you know. <laughs> the only place I've ever been able to buy the fruit is at the Hewa market at Pam's. At Pam's? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hamakua probably. Yeah, Hamakua's got some. And actually the best collection in the world is at, at the, the uh, at the federal repository in Waikia. USDA Germplasm Repository has the official United States collection of from suitable with different ones from different countries in Southeast Asia and red ones, black ones, and different sizes. We did a, about eight years ago, we did a taste test with uh, eight different varieties of Pulisan, which was, you missed that one. Yeah. Probably won't happen again unless Tracy sees this and decides to do it. Well, that, that goes to a good uh, segue into this question from Nancy Redfeather. Hi, Nancy. She's asking, can you sometime this evening talk about fruit parks and fruit festivals that are supported by government and or private business? Does Hawaii have any examples? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, <laughs> the fruit parks in Japan, I mean, which is really where it started, uh, like Tokokuzan and Nagoya, it started in the, in the 70s. And it's a, it's a combination of uh, private business, government, university got together. We're going to plant 500 different species and let them grow up and then we're going to teach people how to prune them we're going to have a lending library we're going to have a store for value-added products and teach people how to make them and this is one location in nagoya in aichi ken japan aichi ken has a very progressive extension service you know um it's just way ahead of anything and they have a uh, 3,000 figs that they grow in you know the milk crates I don't think they had to steal theirs like we do. But they, they, uh, and they have these fig trees. And every year they bring them to all the nursing homes and they let, they let the people grow out there. It's called Masui Dolphin is the type of fig. And actually it's kind of brown turkey, but because Mr. Masui brought it back from California in 1904 and it evolved in Japan. But um, anyway, it grows out. They know exactly how it's gonna grow. They have six verticals on each tree. Each one produces about 20 figs. And the people growing them, they can call up and sell them to the co-op or eat them or give them away, whatever they want to do with it. And then when fall comes, the university extension agents go back, pick up the trees, and they winter them in uh, each you can um, greenhouses over, over the winter and around Nagoya. So it's just an incredibly good program for, for people. And you know, we, we, I'm getting away from the fruit park question, but um, there's nothing really in Hawaii. I mean, we got 300 species that people can come do. Every Saturday, you know, we can have anywhere between five and 50 people coming and asking me questions. And uh, so that, that's good. I'm not a retired extension agent like Mr. Yamada, who works at Togokuzan in Nagoya, who sits there in the library and the farmers line up to ask them specific questions for free. This is the time to come and do it. You were going to ask something, Carrie? Or? The Pulisan, yeah, once you got it germinated, more than likely, I mean, we've had them come up from seed. We've got a couple in the greenhouse now that are like, like this. How many seeds do they have? Like One? No, just like Rambutan. It's, this is the you know, there's a few that rambutan. What's the flavor? Sweet rambutan, sweeter than rambutan, but it's the same thing. Some sometimes the meat comes off the seed, sometimes the testa, you know, that kind of crunchy part that gets caught in the middle of the rambutan. Sometimes it works the same as rambutan, they're very close, only these taste better. At least I've never heard anybody say that ram, they like rambutan better than pulisa. And they, some, some need male and females, but a lot of the varieties don't need it. 
are they're hermaphroditic, so it's not a problem. And you got probably the best guy in the state here is David Friends, who lives that way about a mile and grafts a lot of these things and and produces a lot of them. Birds and buds, I think, is the name of his his nursery. So if you can get them, Deb, you should be getting them all the seeds from Tracy, the ones that fall out there and planting them and giving them to Anthony to sell for HTFG, you'd have it made. But now I guess we got to... So Nancy, one more thing about the fruit parks. There's nothing that's really started here. We could turn ours into a fruit park, you know, with a little help. You could turn... I've been to your backyard. I know what you got there. You could turn yours into a mini fruit park. Um, a lot of the farms here are, are fruit parks. They just don't have all the components and joint ventures with the companies that produce the value-added products. And they don't have uh, affiliation with the university, so to speak. But eventually our repositories on each island could serve that purpose as a, as a mini fruit park where people can come and visit. So um, they already do. I mean, we have two acres inside the National Tropic Botanic Garden that, that Scott put together. And there's, I don't know how many thousands of people a month go, go down that to see Diane Margoni's the original Ulu collection in Hawaii and all of the stuff that if you've never been to the National Tropic Botanic Garden on Kauai, it's worth the flight over. Just join the Farm Bureau and you get that discount, right? <laughs> so, um, but it's that's probably the most beautiful. That's where they filmed the first Jurassic Park, a lot of it there. Where they found the dinosaur eggs under the National Tropic Botanic Garden, NTGB. And they have that one there, the Kampong, where was David Fairchild's home in Florida. That's another NT. I think there's three or four of them now around the country. But that one is, is probably the most uh, incredible. Okay. So, Tom, you got to look at the mangoes. There's mangoes. <laughs> he grows great mangoes. You're working with Glenn. Have you worked with any of these? The Zill ones, like lemon zest, coconut cream. Coconut cream is okay, but our golden glow is way better. I like the non the mine. Um, actually, I like Maha Chinook even better, which is came from the same tree that non Mai did, only it was a, you know, how did this sport came out and grew something a little different than non Um This will, Probably work at lower elevations here where there's not as much rain or up at Kamakua. Um, I know you guys in, in, in Hilo and in the rainy areas always have a hard time with, uh, with mangoes. Um, and, and a lot of the chatter and online is, oh, you got to grow odorata or you. It looks like. Nah. 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 That's the same as, ocean. yeah, you got to be right on the water for that. But then you can grow any of them if you're right on the water. So, uh, but people said, uh, what's the other one, the little purple one? Casturi. So, Casturi, Odorata, and Lali Jiwa are three different mango species that you could grow in wet areas. I suggest you buy stock in dental floss companies first. <laughs> just, I mean, the flavors are great, but oh, God, you're cooking stuff out of your mouth for an hour after eating a custard. I mean, I like it, but I, I'm going to, next time I get a bunch, I'm going to, we have a huge tree. And I'm going to take them all and put them through the centrifuge juicer. because The flavor is great, but the, Threads will probably clog up my juicer. May I put them through your juicer? <laughs> so Cambodiana is, is one that I had in Florida a few years ago. It tastes like a dreamsicle. You guys won't remember dreamsicle. Do they still make those? Cafe 100 had a juice machine with dreamsicle. No, no, these were ice cream bars. <laughs> 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 They're close, right? Sports, <laughs> 
Yeah, it's yeah, the orange and vanilla. Okay. <laughs> Not a world makes the ice cream just like this. <laughs> yeah, but they, 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 anyway, Cambodiana reminded me of that, of, of, of that kind of orange flavor and vanilla flavor. You know, only it's a mango. And we're, we're just driving along the street in Naples, and my friend stopped. Oh, that's Cambodiana tree. And pick one. And said, you, you know, we get shot in parts of Hawaii for picking mangoes. <laughs> oh, that's okay. It was, uh, I'll sit in the car. You can go out there. <laughs> so, anyway, he did. And that was like, so I, I went on a thing about Cambodiana. Now, Roberto, we finally got some last year, and it's full of flowers. Roberto is one that I, I did across um, R2E2 and Golden Glow, and it's named after uh, Roberto Coronel, who was at the University of Philippines and came here often to speak. And was, uh, I used to lecture at UPLB there, and, and where he was. And um, I had a, after he passed, I had to do something for him, so I was looking for the right mango to name for him. And so hopefully we'll have some of those next year. Anybody up? Yeah. Uh, what were the three mangoes you said were in the white areas? Um, Kasturi, Lalijiwa, and uh, Odorata. There is a reason it's called Odorata. <laughs> it depends. I like durian, you know, so it's, you know, it depends on your perspective. Uh, so this is one prune that prunus mume, or like mume boshi, they make in Japan. It's a, there's five species of Prunus mume, or five types, and uh, this one is Chuo, and it's, it's, basically, it's basically Ko, Chuo, Dai, Tsumomo, and Anzu. The big Ume Boshi or Anzu Ume Boshi, Anzu is apricot, so it's an apricot plum cross. Tsumomo is plum, so it's plum, plum. And then Ko, Chuo, and Dai is small, medium, and large. So Chuo from Southern China originally, we grow a lot of, and it tastes like a damson if you wait for it to get ripe, you know, darker purple. But like this, it's a little bigger than a quarter usually. And you can um, make plum sauce, plum jelly, plum syrup. You can make anything with it or just eat them. Oh, there's your madrono. So Madrono is, is uh, there's clumpers and spreaders, you know, when they come up with these satanic names. So now the uh, spreaders are kind of running the show. So this used to be Redia brasiliensis, and now it's Garcinia Madrono. Uh, that's what we forgot to put the Garcinia. And they keep changing the botanic names on it. Oscar probably has a different botanic name for it. So, um, what do you do with it? You eat it. You open it and eat it. It's great like a mango steam, only better because it's got some a little acid, a little tartness to it. Just don't throw out the seed. Uh, plant it. Like on vines? No, no, it's a nice tree, actually. So just like all the garcinias are generally on trees and you just pick them off and I don't know if we don't have a cha-cha on here. Yeah, I we do. So. We do. So there's a whole uh, group of plants that we're bringing in and you know, or, or working with to bring in. And Bucaria, Bucaria is one of them. And this is Anguladas. And actually, this is Boon Boon Ho, who used to run all the experiment stations in Sarawak, the northern, all, all around. Borneo. So I brought all these seeds back and some of them are about this big now. We were visiting a farmer's market. We didn't know if we were in Malaysia or Indonesia because we're just kind of driving around. So wax jambu. Um, everybody wants mountain apple because you grew up with mountain apple, you know, mountain apple. You pick a mountain apple in two days, it's mush, you know, or three days, right? It's just like wax jambu can last two weeks, right? So wax jambu is 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 a little firmer than mountain apple. It's got a, a great taste. It's some of them are very sweet. 
depending on the stage when you pick it, pick it has a, a lot of uh, differences. Uh, it, it, uh, Let's say, you know, we talk about value added products and it's oh, it's jams and jellies and honey and what have you. That value added begins in the field. When I pick things that we're going to sell, I pick them and I put them in a cooler box at the base of the tree and it'll last two or three weeks. If I just pick them and put them in a box and drive around with my truck to someplace else and go pick stuff, they're going to last a week or five days, you know. So same with Chipotle Cava and Suriname Cherry. Suriname Cherry, one day, if you're driving around with it in the back of your truck and you don't put it in the cooler right away, the chef buys something from you, they want it to last a week or two weeks, you know, depending on what it is. So it's very important to understand the post-harvest handling of whatever it is you're growing. Even if it's just for you and you're not selling it, you want it to last. You don't want to pick it and go open the fridge in a couple of days. Oh man, this is like, mm. Tampoy is out of all these weird fruit I keep finding in India and Southeast Asia, this is probably my favorite. This is so much better than mango steam. It's just incredible. You can, you can see the relative size of my fingers. You can see the size of the skin around it. Right? The, the skin is going to protect it from stings and larva things. So it's going to be, um, you know, resistant to uh, fruit fly problems. So there may not be a pest risk assessment. Uh, you can see how it, 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 it comes off in sections like mangosteen. Uh, it's not a mangosteen, but it tastes a lot better. It's very complex. I can't describe it in conventional term. You know, you get mainland relatives here and, and, and friends and try to ex explain what Chipotle Cava tastes like or Suriname cherry. I mean, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to come up with the, the right frame of reference. I, I've been doing it 40 years. I can't explain this one. It's it just it so is. good. It's such a complex flavor. It's a go, here. You gotta go. Oh, yeah. So go back. Doing some for us to taste? No, these are in, uh, this is Queensland, I think, or in Borneo, I forget. Is anybody Somewhere. growing them here? Me. Oh. And once we get the fruit, then we we'll make trees and they'll be available through. So a lot of times you only need one tree, but when you have more trees, it helps with pollination. So we have uh, four trees planted in one section and three more in another section. Sometimes I just put two in the same hole. So one of the relatives, one of the other Vicaria is Burmese grape, which Frankie has a lot of in, in um, Oahu and Waimanalo at Frankie's nursery. And Burmese grape is smaller and round, looks like Langzoni or Langsat, but also very good. A little more sour than this one. Can you go back one? I forgot to talk about water apple too. So water apple are a small mountain apple family. Um, and they come in red or white or pink. And, and uh, these are given to women after childbirth in Malaysia. So you can have a couple of these or a bottle of Gatorade and get the same kind of burst of electrolytes in it. So it's an extremely uh, healthy little thing. We used to sell them to Merriman's and they would chop them up and put it in their salad. So there's one more that I didn't show. So like Tzizigia maliensis is, it is um, mountain apple. This is Tzizigium samarcansis, Tzizigium aquium, and then there's Tzizigium macrocarpa, which is a mountain apple about a foot long, shaped like a big red bell. It'd be beautiful to have it for Christmas. The only problem is it tastes like balsa wood. <laughs> I mean, I keep thinking of carving a little airplanes out of it. It's a little mushy for that. So get, getting used to the, you know, researching the Latin names when you want to know about a fruit is really helpful to see what's related, you know, that you can sometimes use as a rootstock. So like on some of these Garcinias, we'll graft the Garcinia coa to, you know, uh, different kinds of rootstocks like 
Gorka or yellow mangosteen, which is Garcinia xanthochymus, and there's a lot of trees all over the state. But we use that as a rootstock for some of the rare ones. Okay, there's so many types of, of durian out there. And I don't know whether you either love it or hate it or middle of the road. I mean, everybody seems to got a, well, I can see why you two been married 47 years. <laughs> Like, like that. It's like me. She wouldn't even cross the street in Singapore. I'm just eating durian ice cream, not even fresh fruit. And she wouldn't cross the street. So, I don't blame you. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, this is good. This has got the best economic potential for us from any fruit in the state. Big dollars. Big dollars. Thai Town in LA will buy a container a week of durian, fresh durian. What do they do with it? They sell it to all the Thai people in Los Angeles. We don't need that. Jeff will buy a whole ton. Yeah, we got we got yeah, yeah we got a guy on, on, on and they're like we used to sell them for twenty thirty dollars for a decent fruit, and then people would be at our farm stand and well, I, I'll give you fifty for it. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to turn that down. And now they're they're you know they're fine. They're trying to. I'll buy the whole crop next year from you. Well, we don't do that because we don't know if we'll have three or 150 of them. There's no way to tell. I mean, I get out there and hand pollinate. And you still don't know. Oh, that's easy. You just take a makeup brush. I've heard that ants pollinate them very well, um, especially fire ants. Oh, we should get a lot this year that you guys brought over your fire ants to this place. So the thing, I mean, there is no pest risk assessment required for this. You can take it on a plane anywhere. Huh? <laughs> well, you have to wrap it in newspaper, then a garbage bag, then more newspaper, then a garbage bag, <laughs> put it in a box. And so I got paged at Kauai Airport, bringing them back and they, would, they wouldn't take them. And I sat there and fought with her for 20 minutes. I was gonna sue Hawaiian Airlines for not letting me send them back. So I got the guy to send it to me from the post office. The post office doesn't bother, you know, they don't, oh, it's durian, okay. You know, give me one, can we? So that, but if I ship a meringue and can't get this out of my post office, and they, so it just depends on what the fruit is. So anyway, durian, there's a lot of different types too of durian, uh, different species of durian, like graviolans and zabethias and I forget them all, but there's a lot of them. And there's orange ones now, and the red ones. And all. See, you got to you got to grow them all, man, because they're all slightly different phase. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to him. He's gonna grow them all because he's the 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 the. These guys are the future, right? Because they're the ones that got to grow it. And if you grow a lot of them, and you you can easy to sell. Blue is more reliable, but durian Dur durian has got. 20 times the value of Ulu. Mm -hmm. Pardon? You get so much more record on your tree, right? Yeah, but if you want to pick 500 pounds of Ulu or three durian, <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what they're paying at the co op right, right now. I mean, my tenant, huh? Dollar and a quarter. Okay, two durian. Well, <laughs> so, we, were, we were getting durian a couple years ago. We sell it. We sell them with two guy in the farm, which might five dollars a pound. Yeah, they're up to about six. I've seen them up to seven fifty here a pound. Of course, of course, you know they think I'm a tourist, so they're going to charge me twice as, as much. But um, it's um, my son used to be when when the Nani Loa, you know, became the Hilton. My son is a chef. Now he's at Fairmont. But he, he uh, back when not, when the hula hulas just started, and <laughs> my son was a chef there and he used to buy all of Deb's breadfruit, right? <laughs> 200 pounds a week. Wow. <laughs> and that's what 
the average restaurant will will go through of Hulu. So that's the average restaurant is not going to be buying 200 pounds of durian <laughs> unless you're got Thai food, and then the chefs all buy them. And it's not it's not a problem to sell them. I mean, it's all the Thais and Southeast Asians and hippies will all buy all the durian. <laughs> For now, for now, because it's the end point. Well, it's all the end. Tell me if it's going to be the same way. Well, <laughs> and, and from our nursery, the HTFG nursery, we've gone through and sold over 3,000 trees in the last four years of durian trees. How much do you guys charge for the durian trees? 25. A graph? No. Oh, okay. You grabbed it yourself, or you <laughs> dig it to Mike and Maya. But, if we only grafted, there wouldn't be genetic diversity. And we want to find the all the different grafted um, varieties of durian, except for Montong, which I do graft sometimes. Um, they're, they're not any better than the seedlings. Okay. Right. In 1990, 1993, I brought back about 500 seeds from Thailand. And a lot of those are producing now, and they're all as, as good as any of the. Yeah. But they just take a little longer. Yeah, 12 years instead of eight. Okay. You know, so and we have some now that are, are, are producing. Last year, they produced fruit for the first time, and they're uh, nine years old. So, uh, and, and really good. Okay. Oh, here, you're right. See, I forgot already. <laughs> Anybody know that this one? Yeah, because there's... This is, uh, my friend has his farm in, in Australia and they have uh, about 40,000 trees. And it's the largest the cha cha growing. They brought a lot of the trees back from Bolivia. And they actually had cha cha and they, they just shortened it, which is actually patented in Australia, a cha cha for marketing. Um, there's no dance music to go with it, but it probably should be. Um, Anyway, this is like a super sweet madrono or a, it's better than mangosteen. It's hard to describe. <laughs> Get the idea, I'm not a big mangosteen fan. So they're great to sell, but to eat, if I had to choose between the two, I would pick a cha cha, even though it's smaller. So. Well, a cha cha will produce a lot sooner, too. Yeah, five, six years even. Yeah, I've got one that's, I don't know, maybe about that time. I've got first right fruit on it, and it's got a few flowers on one of them. i got about four of them. Yeah. That's it. You got that, Tom? Pardon? Oh, behind you, I was asking Tom if he's got this tree. Yeah, you should put it in between the mangoes. Okay. Moving on? Yep. Oh, here's your chance. We have some problems with pollination where they don't get fully pollinated, but like jackfruit, the carpels grow off the score. These are much, usually long, slender fruit. Um, I can't, I think this is Frankie's tree in Waimanalo. So he's got some, some good ones. So it's it's another, you know, acquired taste artocarpus one. You know, you either love it or hate it. There's not a lot of middle of the the rose. This one is smells much more than a lot of them. But you know, it's easy because I can find them then in the forest, man. You know, I can smell the champadec, smell the durian. No way to if you ever get lost, you just leave champadec at the end. And just so in Thailand, I was I was working for AP photographing super remote telecommunication sites and um I'm walking through the jungle looking for these the trees because the job takes me like 10 minutes and I got two days to do it. So, and then I run into this sign that says, please beware of the tigers. So I had figured it was, like, <laughs> and, and that was where they, I think they just put that sign up to hide because I'm smelling Champadec the whole way. Okay. Um, <laughs> Everybody's got star apples. It's my name for my daughter-in-law, but you don't usually get yellow star apples as the tree comes out yellow instead of green or purple. And it's it's 
on a refractometer, it was a couple points sweeter than, than either green or purple. Cut nut bearing Tonia edulis has these long, this is like two foot long flowers that are really good for attracting pollinators. And they produce this cut nut, which just like tastes better than peely nut or mac nut. How long and, does it take a, a little plant to start producing? Uh, five years, maybe. Okay, because I got two of them from Oscar. All right. Oh, from Oscar? Yeah. 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> so sea grapes if you're down there like most people don't know you can actually eat these <laughs> giving a, a food tour to the chefs at the four seasons they go, oh you got sea grapes and i start eating them and we eat them like poison no they're not they're sea grapes <laughs> well now they're in a variety of recipes and sauces and reductions and you know little squiggly things they put under your fish on a, on a, a plate but this is one that we found in the parking lot of the Hilton on Kauai. And uh, right, Scott? And this is the best, uh, best sea grape ever. And I've had them all over the South Pacific. It's a pretty common thing, but it was really good. Maybe I should change it to variety, Scott Sloan. All right. Rolinia. Everybody grows Rolinia here, right? Nope. Yeah. They don't like it. Uh, no accounting for taste, right? No. So we, Anthony said, you're going to put the botanic name on? And I said, well, there's two of them. Huh? said, Rolinia deliciosa is one name. And then, you know how um, they have names for, for like custard apple and so sugar apple, like and this one is called snot apple. So the other botanic name is <laughs> Rolinia mucosa when it gets over right, because it's just like. <laughs> yeah, so they call it snot apple. But this is probably a top five of fruit I like to eat. Um, it's, you know, vanilla, lemon, caramel, custard, pudding type of thing for me anyway. When it's not over right, then you got to kind of do it through a straw. Right. Okay, and they're selling for five bucks a pound in the market. Now. What What are you selling for? Our Berlin. Yeah, we we don't sell by the pound. We just do it by the piece and thirty on a single fruit before uh, the market. A uh, Berlinia? Mm -hmm. Twenty bucks on one Berlinia? Yeah, yeah. And people think I'm nuts because. I'll buy a little bunch of grapes in Japan for 30 bucks, but those are Kyoho grapes. Those are the best grapes in the world. So I would not think twice about spending 30 bucks for 20 grapes. I thought twice about it, but I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, for one of the places that I lecture in India is GK, GK University in, in, in Bangalore, and that's where they have the Indian jackfruit collection. And there are... Uh, 123 now different cultivars of uh, jackfruit that they're growing in India. Uh, and I love it. We make marmalade and they make jackfruit honey. So when you boil the carpels and put the carpels in jars, um, we, we'd, uh, they have the leftover juice at the bottom. And so we bottle that. It's called jackfruit honey, even though there's no honey in it. Uh, we used to make it. We, that and the Indian pickles with the limby and some of our other fruits. And we sold it to the Indian restaurants in, in San Francisco. It's a chain of restaurants called Dosa. Little did they know the healthy guy in Hawaii is making all their Indian pickles, but uh, pretty popular. In fact, most of the uh, refrigeration cases you can buy from the jackfruit company. It's a little box and you can buy Tex-Mex jackfruit mix you can buy curry jackfruit barbecue jackfruit and plain jackfruit and that's from the jackfruit company that was started by Anna Ru from Harvard and she wanted to buy she called me and she wanted to buy my our jackfruit and keep it in the U.S. and uh, we just want to start with about 30 tons <laughs> I, I don't think I could get you one ton why because we're not organized you know um so I I Put her sucker on my friends in India where they, their 
So they, they take very good care of me now. Oh, oh, the seeds are great, jackfruit. Jackfruit. We grow um, the breadfruit, Kamansi breadfruit with seeded breadfruit. Red, red, nuts. red nuts. Red nuts, yeah. Or, or there's a couple types of seeded breadfruit, even though occasionally cross pollinate, so you get a follow with a couple yeah, of seeds. Yeah, seeds. Yeah, and those seeds are really good. But having celiac, I like to take jackfruit seeds, dry them, grind them into flour. And in, wow. in India, my, my partner's wife was making jackfruit dosa, you know, like crepes from the seeded from seeds from jackfruit breadfruit. So, it, I mean, what you can do with this stuff is just chupa chupa. There's a few here, a few in, in um, uh, this is another South American fruit. Kind of tastes like sweet stringy pumpkin, but it's it's really good. Is it, this is another one. Uh, Garcinia gumiguta, mangosteen relative. I, I don't want to say in the company what it tastes like, but you see this advertised all over the internet. You will lose 50 pounds if you drink this juice. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, it's a very bizarre looking fruit. It's interesting and, and pretty and people will buy it. And I we just don't get enough of them to really get into making value-added products with it. It's sour and bizarre enough where it probably would make a good jelly, but I don't know. Just eat it with mango steam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Salak, there's a number of types. And he didn't put that botanic name. Well, he was gonna put Salaka Zalaka because you just like the way that sounds and rolls off the tongue. And I was gonna put Salaka Affinis. You know, because some you need male and female trees, some you don't. Um, the thing about salocks is they have thorns, like well, quite that big, but they they can get pretty nasty at the base, and all the fruit grows out of the base, and you need like an old bar to, to get in and kind of. And I never get it because the pigs and rats always beat me to it. But it's like a sweet water chestnut, so I really like these things, and. If I get a bunch of them, Anthony will actually drive over just to get a bunch of salad, right? So, oh, uh, the grapes, right? There used to be a 40 acre grape orchard before the war in uh, between around Honomu of Maka with Isabella grapes. They were brought here and well, in 1792, Don Prisco de Paula Marin was Kamehameha, the greats interpreter, and he was growing these grapes on Vineyard Avenue in Honolulu, which was a vineyard, and he made wine and sold it to visiting sea captains. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of history. Uh, Bob Paul, who was chairman of Tropical Plants and Soil Sciences at UH, we went around looking for some of the original stock because in 1804 or something, they chased all of Marin's relatives up through the poly because he fell out of favor after Kamehameha the Great died. And so we're growing these. I mean, I think the store-bought grapes here taste like chalk. I can't stand them. These things have little seeds. You, anybody can grow these grapes at almost any elevation here. You don't have to be way high. At, at our, um, Walmart, Home Depot, and Lowe's, you see different kinds of grapes that they go, you can buy Chardonnay. Don't waste your money on it. That stuff won't work here unless you're up, way up. And even then, it's not the cold, it's the rain. We have problems with pomegranates, we have problems with figs. It's not the rain or too much rain. It's the range of temperature, you know, where these, the natural habitat for these things, it's, you know, 110 in the daytime, out in the desert, you know, and it's it's 40 at, at night. And so you have that rain. You want blood oranges, you go to the border areas of the Sahara where blood oranges came from. You know, the figs from the Middle East. David Fairchild sent back pomegranates in 1899. Otherwise, nobody in the US would know what a pomegranate was. But those came from around Baghdad in the desert. So it's that range of temperature that really makes a difference. Uh, Wampi. Great evergreen tree, you can grow anywhere. Um, there's 
only a few varieties. It's originally from Southern China. And each of the varieties has, um, they're named after Tai Chi movements. So we have uh, stroking the wild horse's mane wampy fruit. And I had to look it up. It's really, a, you know, one of those things. I keep thinking of, uh, what's the TV show, Kung Fu. Uh, anyway, green sapote. Not man made, but the, the green one. There's no open one because I ate them all. This, if I had to, it's really hard being uh, Gemini and you're the dragon because they have so many personalities. You know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I'd have to say if there was one fruit that I would rather eat above the rest of them, it would be this one. And it kind of looks like Mame Sapote, but it's more chocolate. My old farm that we started in the 80s, there's like six uh, 80 foot trees that are producing and falling. So I got to go out there and get seeds or try to catch them and make nets or something. But, um, at, what's the market here on Makuhu or something? Makuhu on Sunday. Yeah. So somebody brought me some, maybe it was you, somebody brought me a couple of these from that market. And they didn't have the trees, but they had the fruit. I was pretty happy to get it. Was that before the hurricane? Oh, no, this was just like last year. Oh, okay. Because there was a guy that on down lower Puna that sold there before the hurricane came through. He had, you know, the... I'm you had a hurricane? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in Kona. We've never had one in recorded history. Uh, yeah, we got to pay for your insurance, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he had a, a lot of uncommon fruit, but once the hurricane came through... Uh, he decided he didn't he didn't sell anymore after that. Yeah, I, I heard about him uh, from. Uh, oh, is that, yeah, Bob yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah, they still sell occasionally. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, sometimes they're on the market, but I haven't seen them there for a while. Uh, it's sour sap. I just put up a picture last week. We got our first yellow sour sap, and it's a, it's one from Indonesia, and. Um, it tastes the same, only it's got like 100% juicier than green sour sap. So when you open it, I mean, it was just, I was soaking wet. And so it was, it was really good. If you were going to make juice from sour sap, it would be ideal. Like you do it, you can't walk into a restaurant in Mexico City without being able to get a glass of sour sap. So it's mostly used for, for juicing. So, well... A lot of people now, oh, the leaves are used in cancer medications and popular on the internet. There's so much, there's so much toxic. They really sent me a paper last week about the toxicity of the leaves. And they know the seeds are toxic, but now they're talking about the, the, the leaves that people have been making teas from her. Was that, that wasn't you, was it? That sent me that? Harry? So, anyway, somebody sent me last week. Last Nathan week. Jim. Huh? Nathan Jim. Good, good okay. So lots of lychee. We're working with different uh, uh, varieties of lychee and egg fruit. So a lot of it depends what, what she's going to sell at the farmer's market, like with, with Mame Sapote. If I get a Pantene, you know, Mame Sapote, it's like a football, literally the size of a football. If you're a visitor and you've never had an MA, are you going to pay 20 bucks for this to try it? Or are you going to pay five bucks for a cepeda mame sapote like that? So I have to think the whole thing through in terms of, of the marketing. Now, if I'm selling to chefs, yeah, they'll like a lot of stuff because they only got to open it once and then they get everything that they need for a mame sapote pie or something. Uh, Petpo Hung is a little purple lychee. It's even sweet when it's green, but it's, it's really a nice looking fruit. They all have different attributes. Uh, we grow Kwai Mi, which is more of a classic Asian taste rather than uh, Kaimana lychee, which is very, very sweet, which, you know, white people like, right? But when you get Kwai Mi and stuff, it's the Asians that really go for that taste. And it's very, when you have them side by side, it's very different. Ceylon peach, um, grow a lot of these. And we make a lot of uh, clones of these. Uh, 
because they're selling the Florida peaches often at the places, but that's on Nemagard rootstock, which needs 1400 chill hours. And some of the need for that chill transmutates to the top of the thing. So you, you kind of have to really read those little tags sometimes. But if you get Ceylon peach, you just take a stick and put it in the dirt and it'll eventually root in two or three years, you'll have your own little peaches, which the old timers use for pickling. They put it in a bottle of shochu, pickle it, make jam with it. Yeah, they're terrible. I love them. You just haven't had a good one yet. Yeah. But you ate all of mine. Oh, no, I had one or two. Um, <laughs> Do you know anybody here growing Erdent Lee lychee? Uh, they're massive. Right? Oh, that's the emperor, I think, is the oh. other name. For that that's yeah, like lychee that like that yeah yeah we have we have one tree and it's every five or six years the lychee is notoriously irregular anyway which is why people girdle the, the trees sometimes uh -huh. if you go to okay farms here you look at their their lychee grove and it's, this is girdled one year and you can see where this is girdled oh, okay. the next year and to help you know stress the tree. i'm gonna die you know and then start pumping out flowers uh, in Japan, they take a chainsaw and with the trunk, and just, just you know, a little bit in just to the cambium. The and grow back over. Right. And then next year, they do it this side, this side, and so on. So every year, they give those trees, the lychee trees, a little bit of stress. I love these things. Hey, Anthony's got finger lines. Hey, all right. Picked by Marty, of course. Yeah. Stolen by Anthony. <laughs> Uh, these are, are really, uh, if you haven't tried them yet, they're really pretty special. These are great on guacamole, guys, because you bite into it, you get this like crunch and a pop of flavor, and it's a true lime. So you get the lime taste with that little crunch coming in. It's fantastic. Does it take a long time to No. No. And they're so prolific. Oh my God, it grows year round. It's never stopped growing. Okay. Um, o Ray is probably, or David Sony and Plum. This is probably Anthony's holding the plant up. <laughs> Little bit of There's a bigger one in the box. Uh, and there's another one that'll be for sale. They get, uh, or if you come to Coney, you can get even bigger ones for the same price. So we, it gets about 40 inches across and it grows straight up. And there's literally, um, this is not a lot. We've had some where the one, one year it was so loaded with fruit that the whole top broke off in the winds. And, you know, my son said, the tree died, it fell off and can't get over it next year. And that thing was back and producing fruit. It's that stress. They like the stress sometimes. You know, I got to fight back. Like every time I have a heart attack, I got to fight back. It's, um, these things turn purple. They're very sour. Chefs went nuts for them. I can't describe the flavor. It's totally different from anything. It's All sour. the chefs at the Four Seasons. Huh? It's sour. Yeah, well, I'll get there. That's how my hair fell out. It, uh, it's very sour, but chefs love to work with them. She sells syrup and jelly as fast as we can produce it at, the farm, at our farm stand. And... Um, it's just, uh, uh, there are cave paintings. This is probably the first cultivated fruit. They talk about lychee in China being the first going back 8,000 years. There are cave paintings in Queensland that are 60,000 years old of O-Ray. So it's, it's been around for a while. And old O-Ray or O-Ray is the Aboriginal name. David Plum is the English name and David Sonia Purins is the botanic name. Yeah, that's right. This is our greenhouse, which is actually finished now. It's a quarantine unit, has 15 feet of concrete all around it. And we can bring stuff in when I get around to writing permits from anywhere in the world, and almost anything, including new types of citrus. And, and uh, problem is it finished just in time for, for COVID. So I haven't really been anywhere since, since then. But, um, that's the, the 6,000 volt uh, fence. So we had the seven cows got below this. Um, 
60 abandoned acres of mat nuts. I mean, a big farm down below us here. And off to the side, there's a small cattle operation and seven cows that out trampled through everything. And uh, bit trees, you know, trees like this, they just bit them in half to get it to leaves. And they pulled this. I can barely close the gates, these yellow handles, but they, they cows just right through it and the springs were out like, like that. But the guys, as they were, when we found, he found out he was apologetic, he was over there every night, every morning, trying to, until he got them all. Okay. That's it. I think so. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Where's the fruit? Now you can get rid of it. See you guys on Zoom. Thanks, Scott. See ya.